This PowerPoint presentation was prepared for the Capital Area Woodworkers in June of 2020 and documents my 2019 restoration of a Yoast pattern maker's vise. Before we take a look at a pattern maker's vise, let's first discuss what pattern making is. Pattern makers make wooden patterns for sand casting iron and other metals by hand using measuring tools and conventional tools. They are, in essence, human CNC machines. Pattern making is a very precise specialized form of woodworking and several specialized tools evolved out of the trade including pattern makers vices and core box planes. Today this trade as a woodworking specialty is nearly extinct. Patterns are still used for casting but they are most often made of materials other than wood and generally involve computer assisted automation as a substitute to the craftsmanship of a highly skilled individual. This short video clip discusses pattern making as it existed around 1940. Note that a pattern maker's vise can be seen behind the workman at approximately 25 seconds into the video clip. Pattern making is another important branch of woodworking. This wooden pattern of a flywheel, for example, is necessary in forming a hollow mold in sand into which molten metal is poured to form this metal casting. Later, the casting is machined and finished ready for use. In the pattern shop, the maker of wooden patterns works from a drawing or blueprint which has been supplied him. He uses various woodworking machines and hand tools. His work must be extremely accurate, and it is complicated by the fact that the pattern usually is made in two or more pieces so that it can be removed from the sand mold. When the pattern is finished, the inside corners are rounded by means of fillets. The whole pattern is then shellacked. The true test of a pattern is the ease with which sand molds can be made from it. If the wooden pattern is used a great many times, the sand soon destroys the wood. Therefore, when many castings are needed, metal patterns are cast from the original wooden master pattern and are used by the molders. The pattern, in this case made of metal, is placed in a special container known as a flask. Special molding sand is sifted over the pattern and pressed tightly around it. The pattern is carefully removed and a hollow space, the exact shape of the pattern, is left in the sand. Into this cavity, molten metal is poured, which may be iron, aluminum, brass, or various alloys. The flask is opened after the metal is cooled and hardened. The sand is removed and the casting has the shape of the original pattern. There are numerous independent job shops which make patterns in addition to those which are departments of large companies. The independent shops do a much wider variety of work although they employ the same principles and processes. Because of the great variety of work, they frequently require a higher degree of skill on the part of their workmen. The Universal Pattern Maker's Vice was patented by Joseph Emmert in 1891 and was placed into production that same year in his plant located in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. The original design was modified in 1919. Although the Emmert Manufacturing Company continued to produce vices until its closure in the late 1970s, most of these pattern maker's vices date from the late 1890s to the mid-1930s. The uniqueness of a pattern maker's vise is in its versatility and ability to position virtually any workpiece regardless of its shape at an appropriate and comfortable position so as to allow the pattern maker to perform any necessary work on the workpiece. Most pattern maker vices also incorporate a set of steel face jaws. While many believe these are to be used for metal work, that is not the case. A pattern maker's vise is far less robust than a machinist's vise, and it will not stand up to that kind of work. The steel faced jaws are, in actuality, a small carver's vise to be used when the pattern maker is forming and fitting smaller work pieces. Most pattern maker vices also incorporate some sort of mechanism on the front vise face to allow for the clamping of tapered work pieces. In the case of an Emmert pattern maker's vise, the taper adjustment knob is on the right-hand side of the turtle back behind the vise handle. 
Pattern Maker vices also provide the ability to rotate the vise 360 degrees. This is usually accomplished by releasing a cam lever that holds the vise in place by applying pressure on the outer sleeve against a hub and then rotating the vise to the desired position, relocking the cam lever and holding the vise in its desired place. Finally, the Pattern Maker's vices also provide the ability to tilt the vise backwards up to 90 degrees. I'll discuss all of this functionality with some images in a later slide. The Emmert vise was highly sought after by pattern makers and woodworkers alike, almost immediately upon its introduction to the market, but it was quite costly, the full-size version fetching $15 in 1911, which is approximately $415 in today's currency adjusted for inflation. In subsequent years, several competitors made slight modifications to Emmert's patent and began selling their own versions of pattern makers' vices. One of the main competitors to Emmert was the Oliver Machinery Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Another competitor of Emmert was Gilmore M. Yost of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Yost had previously worked for Emmert as a designer and became manager of the Emmert Manufacturing Company. After separating from Emmert, Yost filed his initial application for a patent on August 19, 1907, just one year after Joseph Emmert passed away. Yost's patent was approved on September 29, 1908. Despite some minor improvements, including a hinged angle bracket that mounts without modification to the workbench, its similarity to the original Emmert vise is obvious. In 1908, Yost Manufacturing Plant was open in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and by 1910 it was producing a line of vices including machinist bench vices, leg vices, and the Yost Universal Pattern Maker and Woodworkers vise. The jaws on this vise measure 8 inches by 16 inches, and it opens to a maximum capacity of about 16 inches. It was advertised as being adaptable to 28 fixed positions, and the complete vise weighs in at a hefty 86 pounds. Today, Yost Manufacturing Company still manufactures various high-quality vices from their plant in Grand Rapids, Michigan. To better understand the functionality of a pattern maker's vise, let's take a look at a few illustrations. First, the vise rotates a full 360 degrees and can be locked in any position along its path of travel. The body of the vise also tilts up 90 degrees and again can be locked in any position between 0 and 90 degrees. A cam on the front jaw can be adjusted so that the vise can be tightened down on a tapered workpiece without racking. Some vices offer an auxiliary swivel jaw that extends this functionality to pieces that incorporate multiple tapers. Finally, two sets of vice dogs are also incorporated into the vise to hold circular work and other irregularly shaped work pieces. Modern versions of a pattern maker's vise are still available through Woodcraft and Highland Woodworking and range in price from $350 to $400. They are slightly smaller than the originals from Emmert and his competitors. The jaws of this vise measure in at 13 and 3 quarters inches wide and 5 inches deep, and the vise has a maximum opening of 12 inches. The modern vices are also a bit lighter, weighing in about 15 pounds less than their vintage counterparts at about 60 pounds. They seem to be well rated, but some users have complained about their lack of heft and casting defects. These vices are imported from China and Taiwan. A small version of a pattern maker's vice is also being made by the HNT Gordon Company of Australia and is available in the United States through Heartwood Tools in Texas for a mere $1,400. On the evening of June 9, 2019, I was packing for a three-day business trip and took a break to go through a few listings on Marketplace when I saw this vice for sale. Although the seller lived a bit over an hour away and I was behind my time already, I passed on dinner, hopped in the car, and was on my way. Having a tolerant wife and a bit of cash on hand always helps when you're on the hunt for used tools, especially the part about having a tolerant wife. 
As I was unable to immediately begin work on the vise, it was placed into storage. Upon later examination, it was noted that the taper adjustment knob was missing, that the original mounting plate had been replaced, and that the tilt adjustment bar was severely bent. The tilt adjustment bar was removed and taken to my shop to straighten. I straightened the bar using a heavy vise, a four pound engineer's hammer, and a small anvil. One of the complaints about the Emmert vise was the need to modify one's existing workbench in order to mount the vise. The modification involved fitting the mounting plate and creating a pass-through for the projecting hub at the back of the vise. This usually always involved cutting recesses into the workbench, something that many craftsmen were loath to do. Some of the early advertisements claimed that these vices were well suited for copper work and cast iron, but practice in the field illustrated that they were more suited to finesse rather than brute force. Unfortunately, most of these vices were used in industrial settings where they were subject to such abuse. The previous owner of this particular vice was obviously aware of this and tried to take some precaution to protect his investment. The replacement mounting plate needed to be drilled in order to accommodate mounting bolts. Given the weight of the vise, I drilled several holes to accommodate a series of 5 16 inch bolts. The bench is a permanent resident in the shop that I am renting, so I was somewhat hesitant to cut into it. I selected a location on the bench that had previously been drilled into and cut a recess for the mounting plate using a combination of hand saws and chisels. Uniform depth was achieved by using a Stanley 71 and a half router plane. I decided to make the recess especially deep to avoid cutting out a pass through for the rear hub in the underside of the bench, but unfortunately that caused the top of the vise to fall below the top of the bench and thereby limits some of its functionality. The vise was disassembled and all the parts were soaked in a product called Mean Green. The Mean Green was used at full strength and did an amazing job of stripping the paint, dissolving the rust, and degreasing the various components. The large parts were soaked in the tank of a non-functioning 12-gallon shop vac, and smaller parts were soaked in various containers. The screw vise, being especially long, was immersed in mean green that was poured into a sealed piece of inch and a half diameter PVC pipe. The parts were soaked in mean green from anywhere from 12 hours to several days, given my schedule and ability to return to the shop to remove them from the bath. Unlike some rust removal methods and products, there appeared to be no ill effect from leaving the parts in the mean green for an extended period of time. Some of the parts needed a bit of extra treatment using a small brass cleaning brush, but for the most part, the parts were ready to paint immediately upon drying. The parts were painted using Rust-Oleum spray paint. The product I selected was Universal Metallic Paint and Primer in One in flat, soft iron color. Smaller parts were hung and painted in a makeshift spray booth the larger parts were painted using a small riser resting on a drop cloth covering a workbench. Here is one of the bench dogs, the main hub, the rear vice face, and the spindle after painting. The main screw threads of the spindle were covered with blue painter's tape prior to painting to protect them. Once all of the pieces were painted, I began the process of highlighting the raised lettering on the vice. For this job, I used Sign Painter's One Shot Enamel, by far my favorite paint, and a very fine, small pointed brush. The color that I selected was One Shot Standard White, number 101L. Sign Painter's Enamel is hard to find locally as it is sold mostly through art suppliers. I purchased mine from Dick Blick Art Supplies in Galesburg and St. Louis. Brush cleanup is accomplished with turpentine. Here are a couple of close-up photos showing the handle portion of the spindle and the four bench dogs following lettering. Here's the complete vise ready for reassembly. The tolerance of the parts are machined quite close. So close, in fact, that a coat of paint on the inside of the sleeve and the outside of the hub prevented the vise from rotating. I had to disassemble that part again with some difficulty and remove the paint. 
Once I had done so, I applied a generous quantity of fresh grease and was back in business. The vise was mounted to the workbench and was adjusted. Here it is shown tilted up 90 degrees. Here the vise is rotated 90 degrees so that one of the two side faces can be used. In this photo, the vise has been rotated 180 degrees so that the carver's vise can be used. The vise can be locked into any position, whether rotated, tilted, or some combination of both. Finally, two sets of vice dogs add to the functionality of the vice. Although I've never had much experience or luck in using a lathe, I decided to try my hand in making a replacement handle for the vice. I believe that the blank was cherry, though it seemed too light by weight and was very easy to work. One of the knobs was separated from the handle and then reattached using a dowel screw and glue. Two collar washers were made from belt leather and then glued to the underside of each knob to protect them from damage when making contact with the metal pass-through on the spindle. The final part of the restoration was to cut two wooden faces for the vise. I selected white oak for the faces, cut them to size, and then cut a mortise in them for the guide bar to pass through. The faces were finished with several coats of Minwax tongue oil finish and were then attached to the vise with brass screws. This photo shows how the carver's vise is used. And this photo illustrates how a round workpiece can be held in place using the vice dogs. The restored vice has already seen considerable use in my shop and hopefully it will be acquired by some future owner and see at least another hundred years of good use and service. I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation and thanks.